It's October 17th, 1899, and another remarkable event is about to be uncovered by Aria, Rebecca, and Ali, the Retrospectors. The traditional music for the circus, you know, the one that goes... Do, 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 do. Well, no, that wait, what is it again? <laughs> you want more? You want even more? <laughs> you can put the nose on, That okay, one? That one, yeah. The, one, yeah, right, the okay. one that we all know was originally called the Grand March Chromatique, but came to be known as Entrance of the Gladiators. Well, it wasn't actually written for the circus at all. Instead, when it was composed today in history in 1899, it had an entirely different purpose. And despite its whimsical fanfares and playful horns and that very urgent driving percussion, it was in fact intended to be a sober military march. Yeah, it was composed by Julius Futschik, who was a Czech bandmaster in the Austro-Hungarian army, not well known for its links to the circus. <laughs> he was only 25 when he composed the march. He was stationed in Sarajevo at the time. And he was trained in composition as well. He trained at the Prague Conservatory, where he studied under Dvorak. And then one day Dvorak walked in with uh, some oversized shoes and spilled a whole lot of water <laughs> everywhere. <laughs> a twirling flower that squirted you in the face. <laughs> and so at first, as you mentioned, he called it the Grande Marche Chromatique. And this is because it used the chromatic scale. And I'm not a musician, but I can tell you that factually, I believe, it uses all 12 semitones in an octave rather than the seven note major and minor scale scales that we are used to. And because it doesn't skip over semitones the way I expects from the scales, music using the chromatic scale can have kind of a dissonant mm. sound, which can be unsettling in certain contexts, although not all, because songs that use a chromatic scale apparently include Born to Run and Uptown Funk. So how did this end up being the clown song then? Um, a Canadian is the answer. Nothing to do with Fushik, who died in 1916 only three years after the Canadian composer Louis-Philippe Lorendo had rearranged Fouchik's song for a wind band with a new title, Thunder and Blazes. It was Lorendo who took it from being a military march to something that sounds more appropriate for a circus. And you've got to imagine, therefore, with that time scale, the elderly Fouchik on the other side of the world never heard in those three years the version of his tune, which would go on to be an international mega viral hit. Yeah. I mean, it's funny to think of what circus music would have sounded like before this point in history, more or less, because circus music traditionally used to be performed by a fiddler or a flautist, and it wasn't until the 20th century that circus music began being performed by big bands, partially in response to the development of instruments in, in general. It was in the late 19th century that wind instruments in particular were subject to this really radical change that allowed them uh, these new key mechanisms and valves on brass instruments and that allowed them to even play chromatic scales uh, more accurately in the first place. But alongside the sort of redesign of instruments, there was just this change in the way that circuses were performed and they had these things that became known as screamers and this was one of these screamers which were characterised by being very fast paced and basically they'd serve a bunch of purposes throughout the course of the circus they'd be used for grand entrances and exits overtures and finales and the acts that often featured wild animals or other daredevil type acts so all of these would be times that would feature a screamer yeah it's funny isn't it how we humans are so easily influenced simply by the bpm of a song you know mm. it reminded me researching this that weird fact about you spin me round like a record being exactly 128 beats per minute mm. uh, to match the dancing heartbeat on a on a disco floor in the 80s. Yeah. Kind of like that, like the Screamer March had to be invented for the kind of madcap greatest show vibe of these turn of the century circuses because there was nothing that did it. There was nothing that gave the audience the required response. The clowns are coming in, the elephants are coming in, that you'd get when you just played a normal military march. Screamers were at 130 to 150 beats per minute. So that meant speeding up old marches or writing new ones. And sometimes if you had brass players there, they had to do triple tonguing, I learned. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, but as you said, generally, this was wind bands that travelled with circuses, particularly around the States that really picked up this song and ran with it. 
yeah, everything changed around the time of the invention of valves in the 1820s. This doesn't seem like the sort of thing that's, you know, really contributing to public entertainment at this level, but it revolutionised the brass section. Prior to this, you know, military music was dominated by drum and fife bands. You didn't really have so much of the brass band. And as you mentioned, Arian, in the circus, you know, you were expecting jolly fiddles and comic songs. But then once you had these valved instruments and new instruments are being invented from, from this development too, new valved instruments like the tuba and the cornet and the flugelhorn that were all invented in the mid 1800s you had fine-tuned control of the instruments as well as just their loudness they were no longer instruments that you blasted to make a point (laughs) they had the ability to play these very fast difficult pieces and by the time you get to the turn of the century you're in a phase where no american pastime is complete without a wind band Mm. and now it's kind of a niche hobby but at (laughs) this time in history anything you turned up to you would expect there to be a wind band you know a parade a sports match a, a picnic you know towns and schools and companies had their own band and often so there was a huge appetite for marches like this for them to play the issue was that serious composers tended to snub what was called band music in favor of orchestral pieces or marches intended for military bands so these community bands often relied on adaptations of pieces composed for military ensembles which is how they got hold of the entry of the gladiators in the first place because it had been rearranged for you know these popular new wind ensembles And also, obviously, in the days before pre-recorded sound, this was a way of alerting to the town that you're arriving in that you have come. You know, so the wind bands that travelled with the circus caravans, their specially designed bandwagon, partly to just contain all their instruments, but partly to acoustically project the noise they could make, was an essential part of the marketing of the circus itself. It's not just that they're there during the performance. It's like, if you're going to go through a town, what better way to get people's attention than... (laughs) So that made everyone turn around and say, oh, the circus is here. Yeah. So that became a really endemic part of how you knew this entertainment had arrived. Yeah, by the mid-19th century, this new instrument, which was a a horse-pulled thing called a calliope, uh, which was an enormous instrument that uh, gives out whistles via steam power, and that did exactly what you're saying. It was the thing that you brought into the town to alert people to uh, the fact that the circus was now here and they should come along and book tickets and, you know, come and see it. But it's funny how over the years you also had the bedding in of particular pieces of music as being sort of perennially associated with the circus, such as uh, other popular classics, Barnum and Bailey's Favourite by Carl King and Sobre la Olas, which is Over the Waves, written by the Mexican composer uh, Juventino Rosas. That was a waltz. This is me. (laughs) Right. (laughs) Um, And and that was a waltz that was commonly played during trapeze shows. Uh, But there was one fascinating piece that uh, was used at a very interesting moment in proceedings. Stars and Stripes Forever, written by John Philip Sousa, was only ever played when something went wrong. It was designed to be used (laughs) in emergencies, such as when an animal got loose or there was a fire, as a signal to workers that there was a problem, which had me thinking... Like, if there's animals loose or, like, the tent is on fire, alert everyone. You don't want codes that you can, like, just (laughs) communicate to the ringleader, do you? (laughs) Yeah, of course you do, because you need the ringleader to take control, don't you, if possible, without the public getting involved. And actually, that's it speaks to the the sort of tradition of circus of performers coming from all over the world, but then coalescing in, you know, this art form that takes traditions from different generations and different countries, but they're all the same all over the world. You know, so there are codes of practice for trapeze jumping or whatever, so that people are protected and not put in danger. That makes sense, doesn't it? Like, wherever you're from in the States, if you're in a wind band, if there's a problem, play Stars and Stripes forever, and then everyone knows that. That's <laughs> yeah. kind of brilliant. Yeah, it's probably a bit more subtle than Mr. Angry Elephant on the Loose to the Cloakroom, please. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> It's also probably less inherently amusing than watching a lion savage someone to the tune of... (laughs) (laughs) So Entry of the Gladiators had become a circus classic, but I actually think the kind of nail in the coffin of the piece as a serious composition was the fact that it was also rearranged for fairground organs and became a staple of those as well. (laughs) It's interesting, isn't it, that the association with fairground and circus is so deeply ingrained. I've seen some people on YouTube for satirical purposes cut together military marches from North Korea and Russia and China and stuff, which do work perfectly in sync with the original version um, of this song. And yet you laugh because you just immediately associate it with someone falling over in slapstick and stuff. (laughs) It's also fascinating how Fuchik's 
compositions themselves seemed to lend themselves to fairground type stuff because one of his other songs, De Regiment's Kinder, uh, was put into the Atari video game Roller Coaster Tycoon as just kind of the background music because I presume it, it has the same sort of jaunty mm. thing about jaunty it. Jaunty but that, discordant. Yeah, that, may, that is so <laughs> pleasing. Jaunty, discordant, yet uplifting. Be a rare example of a composer that wouldn't want their own songs being played at their funeral, I think. <laughs> <laughs> It'd just be hard to suppress the laugh. Yeah. <laughs> Tomorrow. They weren't interested in living there, uh, and they were trying to govern it from St. Petersburg, half a globe away. Ditch the ads and get a Sunday episode when you join Club Retrospectors. Patreon.com slash Retrospectors.